Good day and welcome back to another very interesting and exciting episode of Logistics with Purpose. My name is Enrique Alvarez and I'm super happy to have not only an amazing guest today, but I have the opportunity to uh, have a great co-host. Uh, hey, Christy, how are you doing today? Hey, Enrique, I'm doing great. I'm excited. I'm a longtime fan of today's guest, so this is going to be a terrific conversation and um, we love spreading the word about more people's good work, so this is going to be a great opportunity to do that. Absolutely. How's your week going so far? Anything? What's been your highlight? Uh, oh gosh, so far? probably the better weather. It's cooler than it was last week, and that's always <laughs> a good thing here in Atlanta. <laughs> cooler and rained a lot yesterday. A lot of thunderstorms. But um, anyways, uh, I'm super excited, thankful to having the guests that we have. Do you want to go ahead and introduce our guests? Yeah. So today's guest is Jeff Schenerberger, um, local Atlanta legend and word spreading quickly. So he is the founder and executive director of Plywood. So welcome, Jeff. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me to hang out with all your friends. This is uh, it's going to be good. Of course. Well, you're up to a lot of good things. Um, we like to talk about good things. So and you have no less than 100 things going on at any point in time. So We'll get through this as best as we can, but we're excited to introduce more people to Plywood. Um, and yeah, it's it's going to be a great conversation. And we also have some great calls to action if people want to meet you and us in person. So that will be a lot of fun too. But before we jump into Plywood, which I will preview is nothing to do with lumber, <laughs> uh, we will first <laughs> talk about um, your background. Just tell us a little bit more about you. Um, I, I know I've known you professionally for well over a decade, but I actually probably don't know that much about you personally either. So this is a good learning opportunity for me as well. So tell me more about uh, where you grew up in your childhood. Yeah, I, I grew up in Lansing, Michigan. And uh, so I'm not from the South. I've been in the South now for, I guess, 18 years, but apparently I'm not Southern still. It doesn't matter how long I'm here. <laughs> Uh, my kids are Southern, but I'm not Southern. And um, yeah, I grew up, I was a, my dad was a pastor. I spent a lot of time at our church, but one of the unique stories, I think I remember growing up and I always had ideas. My parents encouraged my ideas, even though they were crazy. And I think it definitely transpired into who I am today because I, uh, I gained the courage to try stuff. And I remember when I was, man, I was in elementary school, maybe third or fourth grade, and I met this guy uh, named, I think his name was Kevin Rose. I was thinking about that this morning. Kevin Rose, and he, he loved to build things, and he, uh, he would build all, all kinds of things, like furniture and stuff like that. And I was talking to him one day, and I'm like, learning about what he's doing, and instantly, I remember getting an idea really early on, and I was like, you build things. I have a lemonade stand. What if you built me like the most epic lemonade stand? He's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I went and got a piece of paper and drew this like literally epic lemonade stand. It had, it was all <laughs> made out of, out of wood. The, it had a roof on it that wow. this roof that came down, it had wood shingles on it wow. and it had, you know, casters on the bottom. So I could roll it in and out of our garage. And I drew it all out and he's like, let's do it. And I remember, so I had the most epic lemonade stand in fourth grade. And it was just like, I think, I think early on I had these ideas and people that were willing to um, go after it with me, you know, and, and as part of probably how I became who I am today, honestly, and early were on. You, were you able to charge premium prices for that lemonade is the question. <laughs> Well, I lead a nonprofit now. I think I had that mindset back then. Too. <laughs> uh, Jeff, did you get all this? Still uh, a dollar, a dollar a cup, I think, is what I funny. what I charge. Yeah. Did you get uh, all this probably from someone in your family, maybe your parents? I mean, where where do you see yourself kind of getting all this? Uh, it seems like uh, you're good with people, right? You're you're you you're connect with people easily, and and you you can can build uh, relationships quite easily as well. So do you, where do you think you can you get this from? Yeah. I mean, the relational side is definitely from, from my dad. He, uh, you know, he would meet people at church on a Sunday morning. My mom used to make a roast beef every <laughs> Sunday morning. She'd stick it in the, stick it in the oven before church and 
And based on how many people my dad would invite home to have lunch with us, we would cut it either, you know, smaller pieces or bigger pieces. And so there was just always people around us and, and had to quickly learn how to, how to make relationships. That's always been, been part of my life. But I, I will say um, the, my, the business mind that I have, the creative mind, definitely, I learned a lot of that from my brother, from my brother-in-law, his name is Mike Morin, who lives uh, outside of Grand Rapids now. And um, he, uh, he definitely taught me a lot around the marketing and creative side of things, how to look at businesses and how it, how it works and how does it sustain. And he would bring up these ideas with me. I remember just doing life with him. I had three older sisters. They all got married before I was even in high school. So mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time with my brother-in-laws and he, he was one that definitely taught me a lot early on, and helped me see, um, see how to turn these ideas and make them into sustainable concepts. And um, so I I owe a lot of people in my life um, to these ideas. Yeah, really fantastic um, to have that kind of mentorship growing up from both the Lemonade Stand and your own family. It's amazing. And I know you're also big um, and you're very public about reflection and self-improvement and introspection. You're a natural introvert. So Let's look back a little bit. If you could talk to your young self or your 21 year old self as you're just getting started in your career, what do you wish that little Jeff had known? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, it's funny. I asked that question to other people and I, and I probably don't want it to be asked that question. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think one thing that I've learned over time is that I even talked about this this past year an event I hosted. I I feel like when you're leading things, um, you feel the weight of the work. Mm-hmm. And there's probably people listening that whether whether it's in your job or maybe it's the weight of your family or maybe it's um, I don't know, there's things that happen in life and we take on that responsibility. For me, I I tend to my wife can recognize in me where my shoulders start to rise up because I just start getting stressed and worried. And, and I used to call it stress. Now I call it anxiety, which is probably the right term. Um, and so I think all the things that I get involved in, I feel the responsibility for it to be great. And um, sometimes that leads to unsustainable life, you know? Um, and sometimes the weight of our work is so heavy, it's not fair. Uh, to carry that alone. And so I think over time, I I have learned and I'm continually telling myself um, that the story I tell myself might not be true. The the better story is that I can share this with other people and that it's not all on my shoulders to carry. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think if I I wish I would have learned that earlier, Um, I think I think I would have invited some people along the journey with me in probably a more sustainable way. And what does that look like as you try and live that out? Yeah, well, the truth is about two years ago, um, so our organization's called Plywood People. We, we, we work with startups doing good. And uh, in the midst of the journey that we've been on, I, I was working on a project to open up as a co-working space that we now call Plywood Place. It's open, it operates. Um, I was fundraising, I was working with architects to design it, working with our team to get it done, arguing with the city around, you know, the code, arguing with the, you know, the contractor to work faster while still, still trying to raise the money while taking a loan out with the bank without all the commitment. It was like everything. Stand was much easier. (laughs) Yes. Everything was happening at once. We were doing our big event that we call Player Presents. And it was, I got here early to open up the doors for the people who are going to make coffee that morning. And I found myself, uh, my, my assistant Kayla, she found me in the green room of the building we were at. And I, I had a breakdown. I mean, I, um, yeah, I was on the floor of the green room at Monday Night Brewing Garage and just falling apart. I mean, I was weeping and just, it, it, it all overtook me, you know? And so when you say like, how do I deal with that? I, at that moment, I wasn't dealing with it very well. <laughs> I, 
but it was the first time I had really been taken over by the anxiety mm-hmm. of all the responsibility of all the weight on my shoulders. And, and some of that weight other people put on me and it's unneeded expectation. But a lot of that is expectations I put on myself. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really thankful that Kayla found me that morning because I think not only is she an incredible coworker, but she's a, she's a friend and she cared and, and was there for me. My wife walked with me in the midst of that. And then I had some really close friends that were like, Hey, what do we need to do for you to get healthy? You know? And um, so I went through a, a process and I'm still going through a process to learn more about that. What can I handle? What should I feel responsible for? And what should I not feel responsible for? Yeah. Um, and, and it's a question we keep asking, I think, with, with close people. Mm-hmm. It's a very, uh, very important topic in general. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of people can relate to that feeling, that anxiety, that kind of uh, sometimes despair, that kind of uh, life has thrown at us. So no, thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing a little bit, but taking a couple of steps back and uh, jumping to your professional journey right before you uh, had the most amazing lemonade stand, uh, what else did you do? What was your career path? And of course, for everyone else out there listening to us, we will get to play with people in a second. I know that everyone's also a little bit anxious to do that, but tell us a bit more about yourself uh, in regards to your professional career. Yeah, I my uh, I mentioned my dad earlier. He was a when I was one years old, he was an assistant pastor for a guy named John Maxwell. John was um, at that time nobody knew who he was. He had taken over this church. My dad was his first hire. Uh, John Maxwell is a leadership legend, I guess. I don't know. He was a leadership guru. He he knew me when I was in diapers, and um, but in the midst of that, my dad was worked with him for one year, and then. A few years later, John started writing his books on leadership. And so my dad was kind of knew all of his theories and principles. And so sometimes my dad would go on the road with them and sell his books and stand in the back. Well, so the true story is my dad would go and go on these events and he'd bring back a box of books and he'd get pass them out to me and my sisters. And he would say, I'll give you $10 to read this book. Uh-huh. And you have to highlight it and underline it and give me a one page report. <laughs> wow. And this is how we got an allowance early on in life. It's funny because is it not everyone believes in allowances. Maybe that's a privileged thing. I don't know. But we had to do a little work. So what we learned is that my dad never read any of the books. He, would, <laughs> he read the one page. You were the cliff notes. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. If he was on this, he he would probably fight back. He's like, well, I read some of them. But anyway, he, <laughs> in general, he would get cliff notes, the Jeff's notes, whatever. Yes. Uh, the That's such a great idea. Of the books. And he'd Eric is taking notes his, for his kids. Yes. Yeah. He'd integrate them into books. his sermon. And so all that to say, I read all these books at an early age. I mean, really early age around leadership. And so sometimes I'd go with my dad on these, in these conferences, I'd read, I read all of John's books. And so in the back, so I would be in the back, back in the day, they used to have these tables full of books. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of books. And John Maxwell would be speaking and he would, he found out that I had read all his books and he would start quizzing me on these questions early on. I mean, this is elementary school, fifth grade. <laughs> and he would, so he'd stand up and he said, Hey, there's a kid in the back. And he said, um, if you have any leadership question, Jeff could probably answer your question. He might not be the perfect leader, but he knows the book that you should read according to your situation. And if you, if you stump him, he's, you'll get the book for free. He'll, he'll take a book for free. So he'd say that from the front. This is a true story. Wow. He'd say that from the front of the stage before 500 people there. So I'd be standing back there literally on a chair behind the book table. Cause I wasn't tall enough to see over the books on the table. <laughs> And people would come back and ask me questions and, and I'd be like, oh yeah, that you want, you need to read developing the leader within you. And chapter seven will teach you about this, you know? And, uh, so anyway, early on, I've always been a part of kind of this inspirational speaking, not that I'm the most inspirational, but I've heard a lot of inspirational speaking and read books around leadership and it shaped who, who I am, what I, what I think. So when I was a freshman in college, I became an intern with John Maxwell's organization um, over time. 
led uh, the Next Generation Leadership Conference, which is called Catalyst, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of that kind of started started my journey in, in all the work that I do. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and you were before we had online quizzes, you were that little in person quiz as well. So <laughs> good for him. Um, so finally, let's get to plywood people. Let's talk because that's an incredible lead up and it lends even so much more to you now that I even knew before. And so that makes perfect sense with um, with plywood. So nothing to do with lumber, though we have had, I know people join the Facebook group wondering about lumber. So um, yeah, so let's talk about what plywood people is. Um, tell us how you came up with the idea and the mission as well. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, so um, while I was leading some of those other events, I, my wife and I launched a little project called Gift Card Giver. Mm -hmm. And the idea on it was that the, the premise was that people had gift cards that were in their purse or wallet um, that they've been holding on to since last Christmas or last birthday. Mm -hmm. And there might be like $6 on it, or there might be 37 cents, but they didn't use every penny on the gift card. And so we would start asking people to give us those gift cards and we would give them to people and organizations in need. Well, we launched this thing. It was when Facebook first started. Um, we created a Facebook page. We created a website. People started sending us gift cards from all over the nation. Um, There's a couple stories done on it. Mm -hmm. Quickly became national stories. We're on CNN, all this stuff. This all happened in like six months. It was just kind of like this project on a whim and it just took off. And we were able to give in those first couple of years about $300,000 away and unused gift cards, which is, which is crazy. It was amazing. Well, in the midst of that, people started connecting me to other people with crazy ideas like that. Um, it just happened over and over. Well, they'd meet with some 20 something person who had a, an idea that was at that time really helping others in some way. And it was probably done in a creative way. And they see, I don't know how to help you, but I know this guy that started this gift card thing. Maybe you should go meet with him. So I would meet everyone that would email me. I'd, I'd connect with them. I'd have a call and go get coffee, have a drink. I don't know what all the things are we do, but my assistant at one point said, this is getting a little expensive because you're meeting with all these 20 something people. They have no, no money and you're paying for all the meals that you have and all the drinks. And, and she said, what if it was her idea? Her name is Giselle at that time. Mm -hmm. She said, what if we got all these people together in a room? And I said, great, let's, let's do it. Um, and so we hosted this event that we called Plywood Presents. Plywood, the reason why we named it Plywood was in that time I was going to see all these projects around the world. I, if I would get invited, I would go. We went, yeah, all different places. And I saw Plywood as a short-term solution to a long-term problem um, in communities. And, and then I met all these people who were giving their lives to changing those environments and and digging in so anyway started calling and apply with people launched this event called plywood presents had over 150 people there 100 people there yeah, yeah i was gonna say were you at the first one yeah Christy? i was yep this little studio and invited a friend who was right at that time writing a book called making ideas happen it later became a bestseller he shared some of his stuff we had some stories and everyone was leaving and then they're like well, what's next and i was like <laughs> that was the plan that was that was what we had. We had, a, it was, I did it. I did what's there's no next. Like this was it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And I don't, you may have been one of those people who said, what's next. I don't know. I, and, and so we started kind of thinking about programming and environments that we could help people and um, less, less happened in there. Since then, I remember in that same year though, going to Sundance film festival mm -hmm. and sitting in a uh, like a panel discussion around this idea called social entrepreneurship. I had never heard of this phrase. And it was a panel with, and this is, sounds so crazy, Robert Redford was in this panel. He created Sundance Film Festival and a guy named Jeffrey Skull. And I went because I thought, oh, I want to hear what you know, Robert Redford has to say. And this guy, Jeffrey Skull, he, is, he had started something called Participant Productions, which is at that time had created uh, some massive films. One was uh, Super Size Me. That was like the documentary about McDonald's. It was when Hotel Rwanda came out. It was like a lot of these kind of social, um, social interest movies and participant was producing them. And they started talking about this concept of social entrepreneurship where you mix, um, you know, 
big societal issues with new and creative solutions to addressing the problems. And I remember I was sitting in the back row of this small classroom, it was packed, but I was in the back and it was like that moment. And I, I hope everyone has a moment like this in their life where it's like, wow, they're say, they're giving words to something that is who I am. Mm -hmm. Like this is why I exist in this world. They just wow. gave definition to my purpose. And it's like, people are talking, it's like, it's Robert Redford. They're asking questions about being in some movie or whatever. And I'm in the back and I'm going, whoa, this is, this is it. This is it. And I remember I was like one of the last people to leave the room. I never asked them a question, but I was sitting, I, I remember my back was against this wall and I was just overwhelmed with the possibility that I could give my life to this. And um, yeah, so that was kind of the start to part of it. Wow, that's uh that's an incredible story as well, and uh, definitely a eureka moment if uh, there's uh, one. Um, so, and I, we understand that plywood then has evolved through the years from that very first one meeting uh, to become an amazing organization. Could you tell us a little bit more about what is it that you guys now do? Because I know you have your podcast and you're helping others, and you have a place so that startup companies can be there. But so, if you could break it down and somewhat simplified for people that maybe have never heard of you guys. What, what are you, what kind of services, what kind of uh, goals are you pursuing right now? Yeah. So Plywood is a nonprofit in Atlanta that leads a community of startups doing good. Um, we've been around for 13 years, which means I'm getting older. I'm getting much older. <laughs> uh, we've been able to work with over a thousand projects. Um, I wish I could say some of the, that all of them are sustaining, but when you work with startups, the first idea isn't always mm -hmm. the final idea, you know? Uh, but the cool thing is it's, we've worked with a thousand people, you mm -hmm. know, I, people um, that care at the core. I mean, if there is like a commonality with all the people we've worked with, I think it's, it's people that want more in their life than just making a paycheck, you know? Um, and that's not to say that people don't need to make a paycheck. They do. They have to sustain their life and all that stuff. But they want to be a part of something that's more meaningful. And uh, so we've had to build programming around that. We do have a co-working space um, in what the West End in Atlanta, uh, which has been really life-giving. We have an event we do annually called Plywood Presents. And we do programming, um, which is training. It starts with a program called PATH, which is a six-week online program. Leads to a more of a boot camp style retreat kind of thing called foundations. And then we have groups that meet monthly called layers. And, uh, but at the core of all this is community. I mean, most people that are leading organizations, whether that's a nonprofit or social enterprise, or even on a general entrepreneurship program. If I was to say, what is one commonality that all of them have? It's that they're lonely that they feel like no one else understands what they're going through. And <laughs> you get a bunch of those people together and all of a sudden there's, there's a commonality and there's deep connection. And uh, we've been able to foster some of that for a lot of years. Yeah, I have another question I'm going to ask you in just a second, but if you'll talk a little bit more, especially since we have a global audience here, and sadly not everybody's here in Atlanta with us, which if you want to see us all, then we'll all be at Plywood Presents in August, but um, so I'll do the little plug there, but then also talk a little bit more, I guess, about PATH, since that is something somebody could do from no matter where they are, and I love, um, I can't remember if it was you or Kayla that I was talking to a while back, or maybe you said it on stage somewhere, but back to alluding to what you just said a few minutes ago, part of one of the metrics you guys were really proud of with PATH, or at least at the time, was that some ideas didn't move forward past that six weeks. And so it was a great like indication of, should somebody spend their life doing this? Is it not sustainable enough right now? And so that was one of the metrics that you guys had was it wasn't just, is your program sustainable? Let's help you get it launched. But it was also like, giving them the awareness to know this needs to be refined more before they start dumping a lot of money or time or energy into it. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for asking about that. I mean, and you're, you're so right. PATH is a six-week course. It's all online um, and we go through cohorts. So uh, you do it with a group of 10 to 20 people 
Um, we have a facilitator that's a part of it. You'll get online once a week through Zoom, but also um, do some homework along the way. And PATH, we ask, I always kind of explain, it's like, these are the 300 questions your mom is going to ask you that you don't want to answer, you know, but it's going to let you know if you really want to pursue it or not. We, we work through uh, what is the problem you're solving? Why are you the person to solve it? Who do you need to attract to the problem? It's questions like that. Um, it's the starting place to launching something. And maybe you've launched it also and you're like, I just got into it and I don't even know why I did this. You know, it might be good to go backwards in time to start to ask some of those questions. I think our next group of cohorts are starting about September 1st. We do it consistently throughout the year. You could tap in from anywhere in the world um, and it costs about 150 bucks. And um, yeah, it's like a, it's a great starting place. It, some people don't finish it. And usually it's because they got into it and they're like, I don't really want to give that much work to this project. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's success. We have, there is thousands and thousands and thousands of nonprofit organizations that live in this world that are competing for donor money, which is a weird thing to say. Mm -hmm. We don't just need another one. We need ones that are going to sustain that people are going to give their life to to, to pursue, or they're going to work really hard to make it happen. Um, and so these are programs that can kind of get you going and help you realize like, is this something that I'd rather you invest $150 and decide not to mm -hmm. do it right. <laughs> than go and, um, and give up six months later, you know? So that's a program we have. Additionally, if you're anywhere in the world, we have two podcasts that we host. Um, that's all free content. One is called the plywood podcast bunch of free awesome stuff in there and then the other is one that i do with my wife uh which listen if you listen to this other podcast it's called lover work i can explain further around this but uh it's around relationships and we asked the question is it possible to change the world stay in love and raise a healthy family it's a question my wife and i've been wrestling with for years I will say, if you listen to this, you're probably going to fall more in love with my wife than me. You'll think she's way more interesting. Everybody, awesome. everyone loves Andre, but um, <laughs> you, you'll get to know the two of us and our funny relationship and all the debates we have in life. Those are a couple of things you can tap into anywhere in the world. Yes. And you've written a couple of books as well. Yeah. Yeah which are also great. Well, you talked about that you've supported almost a thousand startups. And I remember like years ago on the stage, that was the grand vision. Let's support a thousand. And so now you've, you know, surpassed that already. So, and when, I think we've hit on it in a few ways, but in your mind, what is it that continues to set plywood people apart from other nonprofits that are helping people get their, you know, maybe incubators or accelerators trying to get their ideas off the ground. And um, let's also look forward. What, what are some of the things you have on the horizon? That's a good question. You know, it's funny. You talk about a thousand of this, or you can list the projects. You're doing. I, that's, it's fine. I mean, that's what donors <laughs> probably want to hear. That's the big numbers. But for me, um, I keep going because like I get to interact with real people. Mm -hmm. I, I think like if I if I only thought about it in quantities and numbers, I would have lost complete track of why I do what I do. I mean, I but I come into my office and I interact with Rayani and Terrence and Archie and real people, mm -hmm. you know, that are like hustling every day. Um, and so I think, I think, I think that's why I, yeah. I do this work. You know, I think it's important that it's easy to lose track of why you got into this mm -hmm. in the midst of sustaining it. I, you know, I think <laughs> back when I first heard Robert Redford talk about social entrepreneurship, nobody else was talking about this. This was like a topic that was like, what, huh? What do you mean? You can combine service and for-profit and non-profit in the middle of how does that even work from a tax standpoint there's all these questions people have well years later a day more than a decade later now it's like commonality and mm -hmm. incubators are happening accelerators are happening all these things you ask like what's different about us um i think all those things are really good i think there's people pursuing it and doing awesome stuff very few of them have been around as long as we have there's something really amazing about longevity. 
um, especially in the startup space, like most people are trying to get in and out quick. We've been at this for a long time. We're not going anywhere. And that's, you know, and that, this is no matter what industry you're in, you'll, you'll always think you'll always see something new emerging and you're like, maybe that thing is better. But what's interesting is there's something that happens when you've been a part of it for a long time. You see things that other people don't see. You're not enamored by just the new thing. And I'm, listen, I love new stuff. I, I love it. I'm get so excited when there's a new press conference about Tesla or Apple or whatever. I, I don't have a Tesla. That would be awesome. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, I get excited. I, I, I love new ideas. But what I think I've learned, one thing I've learned over many years is like, just because something new exists, it doesn't mean that it's actually better, you know? Mm. And um, so I think what sets us apart is we've been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, this is part of our mission. It's not just the next great thing that we're trying to make some money off of or something. We've been doing yep. it for a long time. No, it makes, um, I think it makes perfect sense, right? Because your whole idea and your whole quote unquote business model, which I would say organizational model, if you will, uh, it's based and founded on the how much you connect with other people truly and develop this great friendship so the more you've been doing it the more friends you have the more connections you have the more meaningful it is and of course it's a self-fulfilling prophecy which is great so we're as you can tell we're both big big fans of yours i mean no one can probably beat christy i'll have to give that to her but uh she is one of your major fans but so you've been around social entrepreneurs and uh uh, entrepreneurs in general for, for many, many years, you've seen the trends that work, you've seen the trends that don't work, you've been uh, having all this programs path and some others that actually help people think through the organizations they want to build and create. Um, so have you what have you seen? What kind of trends? And, and what is like a little bit more future looking? What, what do you think of the horizon for, for this? new quote unquote new social entrepreneurs is uh with everything that we're living right now the, the pandemic the war in ukraine so many social uh differences that we're having and uh, on justice and all the all the things that we're living through um what's your take on all this and how do you forecast it somehow into the future well well, that's an easy question. Thanks for throwing that softball at me. You can just talk about and hey, solve Christy, world peace in the next five minutes. Christy gave me all the tougher questions to me. I don't know. Oh, just kidding, dude. No, I love it. Oh. I love it. I, you know, I think, so it's funny. People come to me oftentimes. I mean, there's the training we do, and then there's the, right. the personal relationships we have. And I think people come to me at, usually at their lowest points and their most celebratory moments, you know? And recently I've been able to sit with some people in some real celebratory moments, which has been really, really cool. People celebrating 10 year anniversary of an organization or that was one of the projects, the Kula project just celebrated 10 years of their service and work and partnership in Rwanda. But that's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I, all those problems, it's funny. This is where longevity plays a role. Like all those things you just listed. Yes. Yes. It's, been a really hard few years and guess what like based on how things are going the last few years it's like there's going to be something else that's next you know mm -hmm. there's going to be another catastrophe and actually you know what that is not new these things have been there's been problems happening for decades years decades hundreds of years but in recent years we've had access to the information way quicker Mm -hmm. right like these things were all happening in the world but it took some crazy documentary for us to hear about it years after it was happening now we know instantaneously uh which is good and bad i mean i think the thing that is transpiring a lot is that people um, are gaining a little bit of sense of apathy and a big sense of anxiousness you know, that just the worry that emerges is exponentially greater because they're hearing about it more and more and more with every new cycle. And the new cycle prioritizes things that are problems that causes reaction, right? And so based on the amount of reaction, it transpires. The positive in this is like things are starting to change. You know, I think 
Um, I think there's some social issues specifically in America that has had exponential progress in the last two years. And I think that is, I'm hopeful of that progress. So what do I take with all of this? I think um, I, I say this a lot to myself and others. As long as there's people in this world, there will be problems. And the question is like, what do we do about it? You know, and sometimes, sometimes we're responsible for those and sometimes we're not. And I think um, if you're listening, I think there's probably something that you feel probably a sense of brokenness, like where you, you, you feel a personal connection to something that is broken in this world that breaks your heart, that you want to do something about it. And maybe, maybe you should lean into that a little bit. You know, um, you can't solve every problem in the world. You can't, you can't address every war. You can't solve every pandemic. You can't, you know, but maybe, maybe one you should dig in a little further. You could, I don't want to say should, you could dig in a little further. You right. could take a step forward and maybe, and probably you have some gifts that could enhance that issue in some way. And that, that to me is a beautiful potential. Do you future. think, um, do you think that's the role of social entrepreneurs these days? I mean, would you kind of see they're stepping up even more or maybe com being converted into being social entrepreneurs or having a slightly more uh, conscious approach to what they do as opposed to uh, going month by month, uh, paycheck by paycheck. Is that, do you think that's the role that people should play a bit more? I mean, I think it's the question people are asking. I think they're trying to figure out, I mean, there's this term of the great resignation. I think there's, there's two sides that one is like, people are trying to get paid more. And the other is they weren't, they want to find more meaning in their work. And um, I don't know how all that lines up with social entrepreneurship yet, but I, I do think that people want their work to matter in some ways. Um, and it doesn't always line up perfectly. Like just because it's, I, I realize that it's not, not everyone is going to find their full meaning and purpose in their work. But when it does line up in some capacity, I think it makes people feel really good. And, um, and that's a hope that I think a, a lot of people have. Uh, it doesn't always line up perfectly. I want to be really clear about that. But sometimes when it does, it's, it's pretty beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a couple of times acting as a mentor for others. So in a more uh, personal setting or one-on-one -on -one setting. So now you have this microphone right now. So what do you wish you could say to more leaders in the social impact space? It could be advice, caution, lessons learned, words of encouragement, but what is something you, you wish that you have to say a lot or you don't get to say a lot and you'd like to repeat it to a larger audience? Go on vacation, take a break. <laughs> yes. It's like, Amen you know, to God, like, man right like it's uh it's hard work y'all yeah. are working hard especially the last couple of years people have been trying to sustain mm -hmm. through this season and whether that's the combination of virtual school and their work and whatever all the things combined it's like take a break like when you take that break when you step away it's amazing how it refuels you Mm -hmm. And then you can keep going again. And what happens on those vacations is if you have a partner, you tend to connect more with that partner. It's good for your marriage or relationship. Your kids see your eyes more than they see your phone. Um, your, your team tends to feel more responsible in their own ways. You empower them to make decisions when you're not making every decision yourself. And then you come back and you get sun and you get life and you eat good food and you, you know, like take a break and be reminded of why you got into this in the first place. Um, and then come back and hit it again. Yeah. I'm also curious if you, so we talked a lot, of course, about entrepreneurs, which is a, a lot of the space you work in and Enrique and I are both entrepreneurs, but I'm curious if there are any guidelines or advice you give to people to say, um, if they're trying to figure out, should they start on something on their own or should they join something that's already happening? When to start, when to not, when to collaborate, when to not? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, this is a complicated one because you know, I wish uh, I wish I could give you a secret sauce of what right. which projects really take off and which ones don't. But I don't have the secret sauce. I don't I don't know the magic. I don't know what ones work and what ones don't. But and I, and I will say I have a story one time of a guy that asked me my opinion. He gave me this idea and he asked my opinion of whether he should do it. He was like a complete stranger after I spoke in an event one time. And I quickly said, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest in it. I said something like smart Alec comment like that. And <laughs> two years later, he didn't do it. And then two years later, like there was another business that started, which was his same idea. And he came up to me and he's like, it was your fault. You told me not to do this. So I was like, Whoa, I, I don't, I, first of all, I'm sorry. Right. And secondly, I don't, I can't, I don't know. I don't know the ones that work in which yeah. ones don't, but I will say this. One thing that I have learned is um, people that stick with ideas longer, it usually somehow they can point to something in their life that they can connect with that idea. So it's part of their own personal story in some way. And it might have been a problem they current they personally felt. It might have been a social impact, a social issue that impacted their family. It might have been, I don't know what all the scenarios are, but they can pinpoint to something in their story that connects with this thing that they're launching. And they tend to stick with the idea longer than the average mm -hmm. person. So people that don't have that, they usually are in and out in less than two years. Mm. Uh, but if they can pinpoint that somehow it connects with their storyline in some way, they tend to last longer. That's just one commonality I've yeah, seen. Makes sense. No, that definitely makes sense. And uh, you've, you've been giving us a lot of really good advice throughout this interview. And uh, so thank you for that again. Uh, Jeff, if you could maybe uh, for the younger people that are following us and for the younger people that are listening, uh, if you could maybe summarize it in maybe top three bullet point categories or characteristics that someone should have or, or should aspire to have to have a sustainable lifestyle and be successful in things that you've been mentioning, like, hey, take a break, uh, do this, do that. I mean, what do you think like the top three things should be for someone that might be feeling anxiety and wants to just be better at uh, just having a healthier lifestyle altogether. Yeah. I mean, I think different things connect with different people. I, I get nervous, like giving you the, here's the top things I would say, but I, I and I love I, those lists. So I apologize for that. Yeah, no, <laughs> my, my brain's like, uh, what's the bullet points top three, move on next one. No, but you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be nice of if course. that was the case? And like, it never wouldn't it be nice? Like that. It never works that way. But I will say one thing that has helped me is surrounding yourself with people that think and care about those things. Um, being willing to be vulnerable with a few people that care enough to encourage you when you need it and to tell you no when you shouldn't do it. I remember I had a, um, a board meeting a few years back that this is five or six years ago. We had started this, Chris, you probably remember, we had started this project where we were um, employing refugee women to make these bags out of- oh, I have one. Boards. I have one in my closet. You, you still oh, I still have, have it. <laughs> my billboard bag, yeah. <laughs> billboard bags. And it was an amazing project. We were able to create jobs. We created mentor relationships. We did um, job training. We did English as a second language. All, all these types of things were all integrated into this whole thing. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. It brought me so much joy. But it was really financially, it, it was a really hard to sustain all that. And I remember I was in a board meeting and uh, it was at that, it was at a critical point for our organization to determine, is this the direction we're going to go? If it is, we need to double down on it. We need to invest more money. Or are we going to actually focus more on training others in their work? And it was like a strategic direction for the organization. I thought it was like a 50-50 split on our board. and. So we did a vote and I remember it was like a blind, I don't know, I don't know if we've ever voted this way on anything else, but we voted like people wrote 
on a piece of paper and like stuck it in a hat kind of thing. Cause it was a pretty intense conversation and we didn't want other people to affect other people's votes. So we all voted. There's, ele there's 11 board members. I was one of the board members. The vote was 10 to one. We counted 10 to one to end the program. And do you want to know who the one person that voted to keep it was? <laughs> I have a guess. It was me. It was me. Yeah. I wanted to keep it. They all, but, and I was like, I, I was, I was blown away. I was like, you guys, you all voted against me. You just shut me down, you know? And it hurt. That moment, it was hurtful. And it was the most loving, caring thing that happened. Like they cared enough about me. They cared enough about our organization to make the right decision, even though I wanted something else, you know? And it's like, most people don't have people in their life that are willing to say the hard thing that we need to hear because it's going to hurt. And we were trying, like, that's probably why we bounce around between cities. That's probably why we bounce around between projects because like, we don't want to admit that we failed and we don't want to admit that this thing didn't work. And we want to, we would rather just change our friends instead of actually going deeper with them. And so if I could give a piece of advice, it's like, have a longer term view with some people that really care, you know, and they'll start to get to know what you're really good at and what you're not good at. And they'll speak truth into your life, you know, and, um, and they'll be there when times get really hard to, you mm -hmm. know, they'll lift you up. So um, community is a big thing. One of our theme, our theme, we have a theme this year for our event, which is basically just people need people. And I think that's a core belief in our organization and our community mm -hmm. absolutely thank you um well i wanted to also ask one of your other favorite phrases to bring up um which was a mural on the old office wall was the based on john lewis's words like good trouble being up to good trouble um and so as we talked about we're dealing with all the social issues pandemic political division, climate change, all these things, where do you feel like Plywood's role is as far as good trouble? Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's an amazing concept. We have, I, Congressman John Lewis, I had the opportunity to meet him years ago and interview him. And it was like one of those moments that I have the, there's like the edited version and then there's the unedited version that someday I'm going to show my, my daughter and son. And um, it was in, I remember after that interview, I interviewed him with this a, a pretty famous hip hop artist named Lecrae, him and I did it together. We were talking afterwards and it was like, this is like a moment we'll always talk to our family about, you know? Um, he lived in a, story that that we all celebrate but it was so hurtful and hard and he endured it and um so his perspective is just completely different than anyone else you ever meet um and part of that process is i got to know his his right hand person her name is Tori butler and she as he was like starting to um struggle physically um before he passed uh i recruited her to my team which was huge it was a it was like a big win and uh so she leads our director of operations so we talk about things like this a lot like things that she learned being in relationship with him she, she worked him for 22 years what a what a cool opportunity um and so i i don't know what our i don't i i I would say that our community is involved in many projects that are disrupting what is status quo. I think that's the I think that's the the core of what it means to do good trouble to see things that are not right and being willing to step in and and do it. And I don't know how much of that we can take responsibility for, but I feel like I have a lot of friends that are that are stepping in those gaps and and doing incredible work. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you so much for your time. Before we let you go, um, what's the best way to connect with you in Plywood? How can people get involved? Yeah, 
you can follow us on Instagram at Plywood People or go to our website, plywoodpeople.com. Um, love this. I don't know when this is coming out, but uh, come to our annual event in August in Atlanta called Plywood Presents. Um, I think I think if you want to connect with our community, um, pursue us. You know, I uh, we are here to to serve and lead this community. And um, I think if some of the things we talked about today resonate with you, you'll find a whole bunch of other people that you'll be like, I want to be their friend. You know, yeah. and uh, so I think I think that's the core of who we are. Both. Well, Jeff, thank you so much, so much. Um, I actually had the pleasure to attend last event for the first time, and I can totally relate to what you said. That there's so many good people that kind of feel deep inside connected in certain ways, and they just don't realize it, or at least that's what happened to me during those kind of couple of days. You, you really feel that connection, uh, and you're like, well, oh, I'm not crazy. Other people think this way too. And so I, I yeah, I'll just say that if, uh, if you're in Atlanta or you actually uh, want to travel to Atlanta for this, it's definitely, uh, definitely worthwhile. Do so. We'll put all the uh, links and instructions on this episode so you guys can sign up. And, uh, and as you said, yeah, if uh, they want to join, the more good people that plywood uh, events and the community has, the better will be for the world. So Mm-hmm. Jeff, thanks again. And for everyone out there listening to this new episode of Logistics with Purpose, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, Jeff. Have a good Great day. to be here. Thank you.